From Hollywood, California, the Columbia Network presents William Shakespeare's historical drama, Henry IV. Monday night and another imposing list of actors from stage and screen join Columbia to bring you the seventh in a cycle of eight Shakespearean plays. Tonight's production, Henry IV, has been uniquely treated in that the special full-hour adaptation for radio combines both part one and part two of this great historical play, thus making an even more memorable radio occasion for millions of listeners. In tonight's performance of Henry IV, you will hear Walter Houston featured in the title role, Brian Ahern as the Prince of Wales, Walter Connolly as Sir John Falstaff, Humphrey Bogart as Hotspur, son of the Earl of Northumberland, and Dame May Whitty as Mrs. Quickly, the hostess. The brilliant supporting cast is headed by Ben Webster as Westmoreland, Ian McLaren as Worcester, Patrick J. Kelly as Sir Walter Blunt, Eric Snowden as Northumberland, and Jack Smart as Poyne. Conway Turrell, distinguished actor of stage and screen, will come forward in just a moment as narrator to set the stage for the first scene. Meantime, Victor Bay, Columbia's talented young conductor, raises his baton to lead the orchestra in the musical introduction to Henry IV. Strong, ruthless prince of Shakespeare's Richard II seized the throne from that vacillating monarch and made himself King Henry IV of England. To his subjects generally, he was an excellent and wise king. To the powerful nobles who had assisted him to the crown, he was a target for jealousy and suspicion. The king's son, Henry, Prince of Wales, had inherited his father's energy, but having no crowns to conquer, his high spirits found outlet in prankish misbehavior. He spurned the ceremony of court life, preferring to haunt the taverns of London with his chief crony, fat, dissolute, old Sir John Falstaff. Arm in arm, these two roamed the streets and highways, picking quarrels, hobnobbing with bartenders, insulting the nobility. Eventually, they joined up with a band of robbers. In this play, we have the story of young Hal's reformation, his reconciliation with his kingly father, and his coronation as Henry V. <laughs> Now, as the play opens, we find Henry V, fourth, listening wearily to the Earl of Westmoreland, reciting news of bloodshed and battle. The powerful Percy family who helped him with the throne originally are on the warpath again, fighting in Scotland, fighting in Wales, and all the king wants is peace. Peace and a dutiful son. Ten thousand bold Scots, two and twenty knights, balked in their own blood, did Sir Walter see on Homeland plains. Of prisoners... Hotspur took Mordake, the Earl of Fife, the eldest son of Beaton Douglas, the Earl of Athol, of Murray, Angus, and Monteith. And is not this an honorable spoil, a gallant prize? Ah, cousin, is it not? In faith, it is a conquest for a prince to boast of. Yea, there thou makest me sad, and makest me sin in envy, that my lord Northumberland should be the father of so blessed a son, whilst I, by looking on the praise of him, see riot and dishonor stain the brow of my young Harry. Oh, that it could be proved that some night-tripping fairy had exchanged in cradle clothes our children where they lay. Then would I have his Harry and he mine. But let him from my thoughts. What think you cause of this young Hotspur's pride? The prisoners which he in this adventure hath surprised to his own use he keeps mm -hmm. and sends me word I shall have none but Mordek, Earl of Fife. This is his uncle's teaching. This is Worcester. Malevolent to you in all aspects, which makes him prune himself and bristle up the crest of youth against your dignity. But I have sent for him to answer this. Cousin, on Wednesday next, our council we will hold at Windsor. 
So inform the Lord. I will, Millie. The great Percy Tanley are summoned to Windsor. Thomas, the wily Earl of Worcester, Henry, the old Earl of Northumberland, and the latter's young son, Harry Percy, the fiery Hotspur, who has refused to surrender his Scotch prisoners. The king speaks. My blood hath been too cold and temperate, unapt to stir at these indignities, and you have found me. But accordingly you tread upon my patience. But be sure I will from henceforth rather be myself mighty and to be feared. Our house, my sovereign liege, little deserves the scourge of greatness to be used on it. That same greatness, too, which our own hands have helped to make so portly. Who's to get thee gone? For I do see danger and disobedience in thine eye. You have good leave to leave us. When we need your use and counsel, we shall send for you. My lord. Dumbledore, you are about to speak. Yea, my good lord. These prisoners in your highness name demanded, which Hotspur here at Holmden took, were, as he says, not with such strength denied as is delivered to your majesty. Either envy, therefore, or misprision is guilty of this fault, and not my son. My liege, I did deny no prisoners. But I remember when the fight was done, when I was dry with rage and extreme toil, breathless and faint, leaning upon my sword, came there a certain lord, neat and trimly dressed, fresh as a bridegroom, and his chin new reaped. With many a holiday and lady terms, he questioned me. Amongst the rest, demanded my prisoners in your majesty's behalf. I then, all smarting with my wounds being cold, answered neglectingly, I know not what he should or he should not. But it made me mad to see him shine so brisk and smell so sweet and talk so like a waiting gentlewoman of guns and drums and wounds. God save the mark, I answered indirectly, as I said. And I beseech you, let not his report come current for an accusation betwixt my love and your high majesty. Why, yet you do deny your prisoners but with proviso and exception that we at our own charge shall ransom your brother-in-law, the foolish Mortimer. Shall our coffers then be empty to redeem a traitor home? No, on the barren mountains let him starve, but I shall never hold that man my friend whose tongue shall ask me for one penny cost to ransom home revolted Mortimer. Revolted Mortimer? He never did fall off my sovereign liege, but for the chance of war. Thou is belie him, Hosper. Thou is belie him. I'm not ashamed. Sarah, henceforth, let me not hear you speak of Mortimer. Send me your prisoners with the speediest means, or you shall hear in such kind from me as will displease you. Lord Northumberland, we license your departure with your son. Send us your prisoners, or you'll hear of it. Your Majesty, Your Majesty, Your Majesty, Your Majesty. And if the devil come and roar for them, I will not send them. I will have to straight and tell him so. What? Drunk with collar, stay and pause a while. Here comes your uncle, Worcester. Who oh, struck this heat up after I was gone? He will, forsooth, have all my prisoners. When I urged the ransom once again of my wife's brother, then his cheek looked pale, and on my face he turned an eye of death. I cannot blame him. Was not Mortimer proclaimed by Richard the dead is the next of blood? He was. I heard the proclamation. Ah, but soft, I pray you. Did King Richard then proclaim my brother Edmund Mortimer heir to the crown? He did. Myself did hear it. Nay, then I cannot blame his cousin King that wished him on the barren mountain starve. Or shall it for shame be spoken in these days, or fill up chronicles in time to come, that men of your nobility and power did gauge them both in an unjust behalf, as both of you, God pardon it, have done, to put down Richard, that sweet, lovely rose, and plant this thorn, this canker... Bolingbroke. Good cousin, give me audience for a while. Those same noble Scots that are your prisoners? I'll keep them all. By God, he shall not have a Scot of them. I'll keep them by this hand. Yeah, well, kinsman, I'll talk to you and you're better tempered to attend. Well, I've done, me faith. Then once more to your Scottish prisoners. Deliver them up without their ransom straight and make the Douglas son your only mean for powers in Scotland. You, my lord Northumberland, your son in Scotland being thus employed, shall secretly into the bosom creep of that same noble prelate, well-beloved, the Archbishop. Of York is not true, who bears hard his brother's death at Bristol, the Lord Scroop. I smell it upon my life, it will do well. Before the game's afoot, thou still let's slip. I cannot choose but be a noble plot. 
And then the power of Scotland and of York to join with Mortimer, eh? And so they shall. And his no little reason bids us speed to save our heads by raising of a head. The king will always think him in our debt. If he hath found a time to pay us home, and see already how he doth begin to make us strangers to his looks of love. Aye, he does, he does. We'll be revenged on him. <laughs> powerful Percy family plot to overthrow Henry IV. And while the king's fate hangs in the balance, the Prince of Wales sits idly in his favorite tavern, talking idly with his favorite companion, Fat John Falstaff. Now, Hal, what time of day is it, lad? What the devil hast thou to do with the time of the day? Unless ours were cups of sack and clocks the tongues of boards... <laughs> I see no reason why thou shouldst be so superfluous to demand the time of day. Indeed, you come near me now, Hal. <laughs> ah, well, we that take purses go by the moon. Yea, governed as the sea is by the moon. Now in as low ebb as the foot of the ladder, and by and by in as high a flow as the ridge of the gallows. Oh, thou hast the most unsavory similes, <laughs> sweet wag. <laughs> When thou art king, do not hang a thief. No, thou shalt. Shall I? Ho, ho, rare. By the Lord, I'll be a brave judge. Ah, thou judgest false already. I mean, thou shalt have the hanging of the thieves, and so become a rare hangman. Oh, thy quips and thy quiddities. Oh, thou hast a damnable iteration. Thou art able to corrupt a saint. Thou hast done much harm upon me, Hal. Why, thou stuffed cloak bag of guts. God forgive thee for it, Hal. But I must give over this life. And I will give it over. By the Lord, and I do not, I'm a villain. I'll be damned for never a king's son in Christmas. Thou swollen parcel of dropsies, where shall we take a purse tomorrow? Sounds where thou wilt. Ah, thou old bearded Satan. <laughs> I see a good amendment of life in thee. From praying to purse-taking. Why, Hal, tis my vocation. Hal, tis no sin for a man to labor in his vocation. <laughs> ah, good morrow, sweet Hal. Good morrow, Poins. <laughs> what says Sir John Sack and Sugar? I'm as melancholy as a jib cat. My lads, tomorrow morning early at East Cheap, there are traders riding to London with fat purses. If you will go, I will stuff your purses. If you will not, tarry at home and be hanged. Hal, wilt thou make one? Who, oh, I, Rob? I, a thief? Not I, by my faith. Thou comest not of the blood royal if thou darest not. I'll tarry at home. By the Lord, I'll be a traitor then when thou art king. I care not. Oh, uh, if men were to be saved by merit, what hole in hell? Sir John, Sir John, I prithee, leave the prince and me alone. I will lay him down such reasons for this adventure that he shall go. Well, God give thee the spirit of persuasion. Farewell. You shall find me in East Cheap. Now, be good, sweet honey lord, ride with us tomorrow. I have a jest to execute that I cannot manage alone. Falstaff, Bardolph, Peter, and Gadsill shall rob these men, and when they have... Poins easily persuades the Prince of Wales to share in a practical joke on Falstaff and the other thieves. While the latter are robbing the caravan of merchants, the prince and poins will slip away, return in new disguises, and rob the thieves of their booty. The next night, poins and the prince join the outlaws on the highway. Poins has hidden Falstaff's horse, and Sir John is tumbling about in the dark. Poins! Poins and be hanged! Poins! Peace, you fat kidnid rascal. What a brawling dost thou keep? How? I. Sweet prince, where's Poins? He has walked up to the top of the hill. Oh, I am accursed to rob in that thief's company. The rascal hath removed my horse and tied him I know not where. Poins! A plague upon you! Bard off! Eat all! I'll starve ere I'll rob a foot further. Hal, eight yards of ungry even ground is three score and ten miles a foot with me. And the stony-hearted villains know it very well. A plague upon it when thieves cannot be true to one another. 
a plague upon you all. Give me my horse, you rogues. Give me my horse and be hanged. Peace, you fat guts. Lie down. Lay thine ear close to the ground and list if thou canst hear the tread of travelers. Have you any levers to lift me up again, being down? I prithee, good Prince Hal, help me to my horse. Good king's son. Out, you rogue. Shall I be your ostler? Thou go hang thyself in thine own heir apparent garters. If I be tain, I'll peach for this. And I have not ballads made on you all and sung to filthy tunes. Let a cup of sack be my poison. My lord, my lord. Give me my horse. Peace. Tis Bardo. What news? On with your vessels. There's money of the king's coming down the hill. Is going to the king's exchequer. You lie, you rogue. Is going to the king's tavern. Bardo. Aye. Pito. Aye. Ketso. Aye. Hawks out. Aye. Sirs, you four shall front them in the narrow lane. Poins and I will walk lower. If they escape from your encounters, then they light on us. How many be there of them? Some eight or ten. Ooh, zounds. Will they not rob us? What? A coward, Sir John Paunch? Indeed, I am not John of Gaunt, your grandfather... But yet no coward, Hal. Well, we'll leave that to the proof. Farewell, and stand fast. Come, neighbor. The boy shall lead us from horses down the hill. We'll walk for a while. And ease our legs. Stand! Stand! Down with it! Cut the villain's throat! Oh, we are undone! Ye gore-bellied knaves, are ye undone? Ah! Down with them. Oh, God of mercy. God, I'll find them. Aye. Oh, bless us, bless us. Oh, caterpillars, bacon-fed knaves. That's them. Fleece them. Fleece them. Aye. Oh, oh. Ye fat chups, I would you had your store in right here. Oh, bless us, bless us. What, ye knaves? Young men must live. Now, on, bacon. Oh, on. Points. Points, the thieves have bound the true men. Now, could thou and I rob the thieves and go merrily to London? It would be argument for a week, laughter for a month, and a good jest forever. <laughs> Where are our disguises? Hard by. Stand close, I hear them coming. <laughs> Come, my master. <laughs> Let us share, and then to horse before day. Aye. Aye. And the prince and points be not two arrant cowards. There's no equity stirring. Aye. There's no more valor in that points than in a wild duck. No. <laughs> Here. Here. Giovanni! Stand on the machine! Got with much ease. <laughs> now, merrily the horse. The thieves are all scattered and possessed with fear. <laughs> Falstaff sweats to death and lards the lean earth as he walks along. <laughs> Were it not for laughing, I should pity him. <laughs> Away, good points. <laughs> How the rogue roared. <laughs> Prince of Wales and Poins now return to the tavern. Shortly after their arrival, Paul Stuck and his companions burst into the room. Old Sir John is puffing and blowing with rage. Welcome, Jack, welcome. Where hast thou been? A plague of all cowards, I think. Give me a cup of sack. Oh, no, wool sack. A king's son. If I do not beat thee out of thy kingdom with a dagger of laugh and drive all thy subjects before thee... Like a flock of wild geese, I'll never wear hair on my face more. You, Prince of Wales. Why, you uh, plague of a round man, what's the matter? Are you not a coward? Answer me that. And points there. Zounds, you fat paunch, and you call me coward, but the Lord, I'll stab thee. I call thee coward. I'll see thee damned or I call thee coward. But I'd give a thousand pounds I could run as fast as thou canst. Give me a cup of sack. I'm a rogue if I drunk today. Oh, villain. Thy lips are scarce wiped since thou drunkest last. All's one for that. Plague of all cowards. Still, say I. Why, what's the matter? What's the matter? There be four of us here have taken a thousand pounds this day morning. Where is it, Jack? Where is it? Where is it? Taken from us it is. A hundred upon poor four of us. 
What? A hundred men? I am a rogue if I were not at half swords with a dozen of them two hours together. Oh, oh I've escaped by miracle. I'm eight times thrust through the doublet, four through the holes, my buckler cut through and through, my sword hacked like a handsaw. I never dealt better since I was a man. All would not do. A plague of all cowards. Let them speak. If they speak more or less than truth, they are villains and the sons of darkness. Speak, sirs. How was it? We four set upon some dozen. Sixteen at least. And bound them. No, no, they were not bound. You rogue, they were bound. Every man of them. As we were sharing, some six or seven fresh men sat upon us. And unbound the rest. And then came in the other. What? Fought you with them all? All. I know not what you call all, but if I fought not with 50 of them, I'm a bunch of reddish. <laughs> Pray God you've not murdered some of them. Nay, that's past praying for. I've peppered two of them. Two I'm sure I've paid. Two rogues in Buckram's suit. <laughs> <laughs> I tell thee what, Hal. If I tell thee a lie, spit in me face. Call me horse. Four rogues in Buckram let drive at me. Four, thou saidst, but two. Four, Hal, I told thee four. Aye, aye, he said four. These four came all afront and mainly thrust at me. I made me no more ado about that, but took all their seven points in my target. Thus seven? Why, there were but four even now. In Buckram? Aye, four in Buckram suits. Seven by these hills. Or I'm a villain else. <laughs> oh, prithee, let him alone. We shall have more anon. <laughs> Dost thou hear me, Hal? Aye, and mark thee too, Jack. I'll do so, for it's worth the listening to. These nine men in Buckram that I told thee of... <laughs> Two more already! ...began to give me ground, but I followed so close, came in foot in hand, and with a thought seven of the eleven, I paid... Oh, monstrous! Eleven Buckram men grown out of two. But as the devil would have it... Three misbegotten knaves in Kendall Green came at my back and let drive at me. For it was so dark, Hal, thou couldst not see thy hand. Why, how couldst thou know these men in Kendall Green when eh? it was so dark thou couldst not see thy hand? Uh, I'll no longer be guilty of this sin. Oh, this sanguine oh, coward, this bed presser, this horseback breaker, this huge hill of flesh. Oh, <laughs> you starveling, you eel skin, you dried neat tongue, you stockfish. Oh, 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 for breath to utter what is like thee. Well, breathe a while and then to it again. And when thou hast tired thyself in base comparison, hear me speak but this. Mark, Jack. We two saw you four set on two and bound them and were masters of their wealth. Mark now how a plain tale shall put you down. Then did we two set on you four and with a word out faced you from your prize and have it. Oh. Yea, and can show it you here in the house. And false stuff, you carried your guts away as nimbly and with as quick dexterity and roared for mercy and still ran and roared as ever I heard bull calf. <laughs> Why, what a slave art thou to hack thy sword as thou hast done and then say it was in fight. <laughs> what trick canst thou now find out to hide thee from this open and apparent shame? Come, let's hear, Jack. What trick hast thou now? Oh, 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 by the Lord... I knew ye as well as he that made ye. Oh! <laughs> Why, hear ye, me masters. Was it for me to kill the heir apparent? Should I turn upon the true prince? No, no, no. <laughs> but by the Lord, lads, I'm glad you have the money. Hostess, clap to the doors. Watch tonight, pray tomorrow. Gallants, lads, boys, hearts of gold. All the titles of good fellowship come to you. Oh, my lord, the prince. How oh, now, my lady, the hostess. My lord, there is a nobleman of the court of door would speak with you. He says he comes from your father. Well, give him as much as will make him a royal man and send him back again to my father. Hal, shall I give him his answer? Oh, pretty do, Jack. Faith, and I'll send him packing. Hey, Peto, <coughs> tell me now in earnest, how came Falstaff's sword so hacked? Why, he hacked it with his dagger. And said he would make you believe it was done in fight. And persuaded us to do the like. <laughs> Here comes Jack. Here comes Barebone. How oh, now, my sweet creature of bombast? There's villainous news abroad. Here was Sir John Bracy come from your father. You must to the court in the morning. 
That same mad fellow of the North, Hotspur, and that sprightly Scot of Scots, Douglas, and Worcester is stolen away tonight. Thy father's beard is turned white with the news. Tell me, Hal, art not thou horribly afeard? Thou being heir apparent, could the world pick thee out three such enemies? Art thou not horribly afeard? Not a whit. I lack some of thy instinct. Oh, my lord, my lord, the sheriff with the most monstrous watches at the door. They're come to search the house. Dost thou hear, Hal? If you will deny the sheriff, so. If not, let him enter. <laughs> Go, hide thee behind the arras, Jack. Call in the sheriff. Sheriff? My lord. Now, Master Sheriff, what is your will with me? First, pardon me, my lord. A you and Cry have followed certain men unto this house. What men? One of them is well known, my gracious lord. A gross fat man, as fat as butter. Oh, the man, I do assure you, is not here. My lord, there are two gentlemen have in this robbery lost 300 marks. It may be so. If he have robbed these men, he shall be answerable. And so let me entreat you, leave the house. I will. Good night, my noble lord. <laughs> I think it is good morrow, is it not? Indeed, my lord. I think it'd be two o'clock. This oily rascal Falstaff is known as well as Paul's. <laughs> Go, call him for. Falstaff! <laughs> Fast asleep behind the arras and snoring like a horse. <laughs> oh, hark, how hard he fetches breath. Search his pockets. Aye. What hast thou found? Mm, nothing but papers, my lord. But let's see what they be. Read them. Yeah. Item, a cape on two shilling and tuppence. Item, sauce, fourpence. Item, sack, two gallons, five shillings, and eight oh. <laughs> Item, anchovies and sack after supper, two shilling and sixpence. <laughs> Item, bread, a half penny. Oh. oh, monstrous. But one half penny worth of bread to all this intolerable deal of sack. <laughs> well, what there is else, keep close. We'll read it at more advantage. There, let him sleep till day. I'll to the court in the morning, and the money shall be paid back again with advantage. We must all to the wars. Good morrow, Pines. Good morrow, good my lord. You have just heard the first part of Columbia's presentation of Henry the Fourth, starring Walter Houston, Brian O'Hearn, Walter Connolly, Humphrey Bogart, and Dame May Whitty. The play will continue in just a moment. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Now, we continue with the second part of Shakespeare's Henry IV, and again your narrator, Conway Turrell, comes forward to set the scene. With the rebels in arms against the royal power, Henry IV summons the Prince of Wales to appear at court. Now he enters the throne room where the king sits conferring with his generals. The animated discussion halts in midair. The nobles look askance at young Hal. His father eyes him gravely for a moment in the heavy silence which has fallen over the room. Lords, give us leave. The Prince of Wales and I must have some private conference. But be near at hand, for we shall presently have need of you. I know not whether God will have it so for some displeasing service I have done that in his secret doom, out of my blood, he'll breed revengement and a scourge for me. But thou dost in thy passages of life make me believe thou art only marked for the hot vengeance and the rod of heaven to punish my mistreadings. So please, Your Majesty, I would I could quit all offenses with as clear excuse, as well as I am doubtless, I can purge myself of many I am charged with all. God pardon thee. Yet let me wonder, Harry, at thy affections, which do hold a wing quite from the flight of all thy ancestors. Thy place in council has been rudely lost. The hopes and expectations of thy time is ruined, and the soul of every man prophetically doth what think thy fall. For thou hast lost thy princely privilege with vile participation. Not an eye but is a weary of thy common sight, save mine. I shall hereafter, my thrice gracious lord, be more myself. 
All the world as thou art to this hour was richer then when I from France set foot at Ravenspur. E'en as I was then is Hotspur now. Now by my scepter and my soul to boot, he hath more worthy interest to the state than thou, the shadow of succession. Thrice hath this Hotspur, Mars in swaffling clothes, this infant warrior in his enterprises discomfited great Douglas, tain him once, enlarged him and made a friend of him to fill the mouth of deep defiance up and shake the peace and safety of our throne. What say you to this? Hotspur, Northumberland, the Archbishop's Grace of York, Douglas, Mortimer, capitulate against us and are up. But wherefore do I tell these news to thee? Why, Harry, do I tell thee of my foes, which are my nearest and dearest enemy? Thou art like enough through vassal fear, base inclination and the start of spleen, to fight against me under hot spurs pay, to dog his heels and curtsy at his frowns, to show how much thou art degenerate. Oh, do not think so. You shall not find it so. And God forgive them that have so much swayed your majesty's good thoughts away from me. I will redeem all this on Hotspur's head. And in the closing of some glorious day, be bold to tell you that I am your son. And that shall be the day, whene'er it lights, that this same child of honor and renown, this gallant Hotspur, and this all-praised knight, and your unthought-of Harry, chance to meet. For every honor sitting on his helm, would they were multitudes, and on my head my shames are redoubled. For the time will come when I shall make this northern youth exchange his glorious deeds for my indignities. This, in the name of God, I promise here, and I will die a hundred thousand deaths ere break the smallest parcel of this vow. A hundred thousand rebels die in this. Thou shalt have charge and sovereign trust herein. Your Majesty! How now, Sir Walter Blunt? Thy looks are full of speed. So is the business that I come to speak of. Lord Mortimer of Scotland had sent word that Douglas and the English rebels met the 11th of this month at Shrewsbury. Eh? On Wednesday next, Harry, you shall set forward. On Thursday, we ourselves will march. Our hands are full of business. Let's away. Advantage feeds him fat while men delay. <laughs> Meanwhile, in the tavern, Falstaff has awakened from his drunken stupor. He's railing at the hostess. How now, dame hostess? Have you inquired yet who picked me pocket? Aye, I warrant you. Why, the tithe of a hair was never lost in my house before. You lie, hostess. I'll be sworn my pocket was picked. Why, Sir John, do you think I keep thieves in my house? Go to, go to. You are a woman. Go a woman? I? God's light! I was never called so in my own house before. Oh, too. I know you well enough. No, Sir John. You do not know me, Sir John. I know you, Sir John. You owe me money, Sir John. And now you pick a quarrel to beguile me of it. I'll pay not a denny. I've lost a seal ring of my grandfather's worth 40 marks. Oh, I've heard the prince tell him I know not how often. But that ring was copper. Now, the prince is a jack, a sneak up. Splud, and he were here, I'd cuddle him like a dog, if he would say so. The prince comes. The prince. The prince. Wales comes marching down the street, the head of a detachment of troops. My lord, my lord, my lord, I pray you hear me. What sayest thou, Mistress Quickly? Prithee, let her alone and listen to me. What sayest thou, Jack? The other night I fell asleep here behind the arras and had my pocket picked. This house is turned bawdy house. They pick pockets. Uh, what didst thou lose, Jack? Wilt thou believe me, Hal? Three or four bonds of forty pounds apiece and a seal ring of my grandfather's. Oh, a trifle, some eightpenny matter. So I told you, my lord, and I said I heard your grace say so. And my lord, he speaks most vilely of you, like a foul-mouthed man as he is. And said he would cudgel you. What? He did not. There's neither faith, truth, nor womanhood in me else. There's no more faith in thee than in a stewed prune. Tilly Fally. Nay, my lord. He called you Jack and said he would cudgel you. Yea, if he said my ring was copper. Well, I say tis copper. 
Darest thou be as good as thy word now? Nay, and I do, I pray God, may girdle break. Charge an honest woman with picking thy pocket? Why, thou impudent, embossed rascal, if there were anything in thy pocket but taverning reckonings, m- memorandums of bawdy houses, oh. and one poor pennyworth of sugar candy to make thee long-winded, well, if thy pocket were enriched with any other injuries but these, I am a villain. Why, art thou not ashamed? You confess, then. You picked me pocket. Well, it appears so, but a story. Hostess, I forgive thee. Oh? Go, get, make ready breakfast. What? Look to thy servant. Well. Cherish thy guest. You. Love thy husband. Well, of all Nay, nay, nay. Oh, nay. Prithy, prithy, be gone. The villain, scurvy, nay, bastardly. Now, hell, to the news at court. For the robbery, lad. How is that answered? Oh, my sweet beef. I must still be good angel to thee. The money is paid back again. I do not like that paying back. I am good friends with my father and may do anything. Rob me the exchequer the first thing thou doest. (laughs) I have procured thee, Jack, a charge of foot in this war. I would it had been of horse. Bardolf! To horse, to horse, for thou and I have 30 miles to ride ere dinner time. Aye, sir. Jack, meet me tomorrow in the temple hall at two o'clock in the afternoon. There thou shalt know thy charge. The land is burning, hot's purse stands on high, and either we or they must lower lie. England is in arms. From every part of the the kingdom, soldiers march to join the civil war. The rebel troops drawn up in battle array by Hotspur are put at disadvantage by the sudden illness of Northumberland. Pendal is two weeks late recruiting his troops. Hotspur and the equally fiery Douglas are determined to go on ahead without them. Worcester and Vernon urged delay. Throughout the night, they wrangle, pacing the dimly lighted tent. We'll fight with him tonight. It may not be. You give him an advantage. Not a whit. Why say you so? Looks he not for supply? So do we. His is certain, ours is doubtful. Good, cousin, be advised. Stir not tonight. Do not, my lord. Vernon, you do not counsel well. You speak it out of fear and cold heart. Do me no slander, Douglas. By my life, I hold as little counsel with weak fear as you, my lord. Or any Scot that this day lives. Let it be seen tomorrow in the battle which of us fears. Day or tonight? Content. Tonight, say I. Come, come, it may not be. I wonder much. Being men of such great leading as you are, that you foresee not what impediments drag back our expedition. Your Uncle Worcester's horse came but today, and now their pride and mettle is asleep. Their courage with hard labor, tame and dull. So are the horses of the enemy. The better part of ours are full of rest. The number of the king exceedeth ours. For God's sake, cousin, stay till all come in. My lord, Sir Walter Blunt. Welcome, Sir Walter Blunt. And would to God you were of our determination. The king has sent to know the nature of your griefs. And whereupon you conjure from the breast of civil peace such bold hostility, teaching his duteous land audacious cruelty... If that the king have any way your good deserts forgot, which he confesseth to be manifold, he bids you name your griefs, and with all speed you shall have your desires with interest, and pardon absolute for yourself and these herein misled by your suggestion. The king is kind, and well we know the king knows at what time to promise when to pay. My father and my uncle and myself did give him that same royalty he wears. I come not to hear this. Then to the point. He deposed the king. Soon after that, deprived him of his life. And in the neck of that task, the whole state disgraced me in my happy victories. And in conclusion, drove us to seek out this head of safety. And with all to pry into his title, the which we find too indirect for long continuance. Shall I return this answer to the king? Not so, Sir Walter. We'll withdraw a while. Go to the king, and let there be in pawn some surety for a safe return again. And in the morning early shall my uncle bring him our purposes. And so farewell. I would you would accept of grace and love. And maybe so we shall. Pray God you do. The 
Lord Encampment, the King and the Prince of Wales watched the dawn break over the field of battle. They await a messenger from the rebel camp. How bodily the sun begins to peer above yon busky hill. The day looks pale at his distemperature. The southern wind doth play the trumpet to his purpose, and by his hollow whistling in the leaves foretells a tempest and a blustering day. Then with the losers let it sympathize, for nothing can seem foul to those that win. My lord of Worcester. Your majesty. An arm, my lord of Worcester. It is not well that you and I should meet upon such terms as now we meet. You have deceived our trust and made us doff our easy robes of peace to crush our old limbs in ungentle steel. This is not well, my lord. This is not well. Hear me, my liege. For mine own part, I could be well content to entertain the lag end of my life with quiet hours. For I do protest I have not sought the day of this dislike. You have not sought it? How comes it then? It pleased your majesty to turn your looks of favor from myself and all our house. And yet I must remember you, my lord, we were the first and dearest of your friends. For you, my staff of office, did I break in Richard's time and posted day and night to meet you on the way and kiss your hand. It was myself, my brother, and his son that brought you home and boldly did out dare the dangers of the time. These things indeed have you have articulate proclaimed at market crosses, read in churches, to face the garment of rebellion of pell-mell havoc and confusion. In both your armies, there is many a soul shall pay full dearly for this encounter if once they join in trial. My lord of Worcester, tell your nephew, I, the Prince of Wales, do join with all the world in praise of him. I do not think a braver gentleman, more daring or more bold, is now alive to grace this latter age with noble deeds. For my part, I may speak it to my shame, I have a truant been to chivalry, and so I hear he doth account me too. Yet this before my father's majesty. I am content that he shall take the odds of his great name and estimation, and will, to save the blood on either side... Try fortune with him in a single fight. And, Prince of Wales, so dare we venture thee, albeit considerations infinite do make against it. No good was to know. We love our people well. Even those we love that are misled upon your cousin's part. Will they take the offer of our grace? Both he and they and you. Yea, every man shall be my friend again. And I'll be his. So tell your cousin and bring me word what he will do. But if he will not yield... Rebuke and dread correction wait on us. They shall do their office, so be gone. Leech. We will not now be troubled with reply. We offer fair. Take it advisedly. The wily Earl of Worcester fears that Hotspur will be influenced by the king's fair offer and determines not to repeat the message. Uncle, what news? The king will bid you battle presently. There is no seeming mercy in the king. Did you beg any? God forbid. I told him gently of our grievances. He calls us rebels, traitors, and will scourge with haughty arms this hateful name in us. The Prince of Wales stepped forth before the king, and nephew challenged you to single fight. Oh, would the quarrel lay upon our heads, and that no man might draw a short breath today, but I and Harry Monmouth, Prince of Wales. Yet once ere night I will embrace him with a soldier's arm, that he shall shrink under my courtesy. Arm! Arm with speed, and fellow soldiers, friends, better consider what you have to do than I that have not well the gift of tongue can lift your blood up with persuasion. My lord, prepare. The king comes on apace. Let each man do his best. And here draw I a sword whose temper I intend to stain with the best blood that I can meet with all in the adventure of this perilous day. Now, Esperance, Percy, and set on. Sound all the lofty instruments of war, and by that music let us all embrace. For heaven to earth, some of us never shall a second time do such a courtesy. Battle rages fiercely. On both sides, brave men are killed and maimed and lost to England forever. But as the day wanes, when only the strongest and luckiest still stand, the two great protagonists of the drama meet at last, both bleeding, both weary, and both determined. 
I mistake not, thou art Harry Monmouth. Thou speakst as if I would deny my name. My name is Harry Percy. Why, then I see a very valiant rebel of the name. I am the Prince of Wales, and think not Hotspur to share with me in glory anymore. Two stars keep not their motion in one sphere, nor can one England brook a double reign of Harry Percy and the Prince of Wales. Nor shall it, Harry, for the hour has come to end the one of us. And would to God thy name and arms were now as great as mine. I'll make it greater ere I part from thee. And all the budding honors on thy crest, I'll crop to make a garland for my head. Oh, I can no longer put thy vanity. Bless thee then! Oh, oh. oh Harry, thou hast robbed me of my youth. I better brook the boss loss of brittle life and those proud titles thou hast won of me. They wound my thoughts worse than I saw in my flesh. The thoughts, the slaves of life, life times fool, and time that takes away of all the world must have a stop. Oh, I could prophesy, but at the earthy and cold hand of death lies on my tongue. No. Hotspur. Thou art dust. And food. For, oh. For worms, brave Hotspur. Fare thee well, great heart. Ill-weaved ambition. How much art thou shrunk. When that this body did contain a spirit. A kingdom for it was too small a bound. But now... Two paces of the vilest earth is room enough. This earth that bears thee dead bears not alive so stout a gentleman. Adieu, and take thy praise with thee to heaven. The death of Hotspur cracks the power of the rebels. But long months of fighting must go on. The Prince of Wales, having dealt with his personal adversary, loses interest and returns to his old haunts and companions. The king is broken in health by the strain of war and is discouraged by the relapse of his son. He falls into a serious illness. The Prince of Wales is summoned hastily to the palace. Now the king and the prince are together in the royal chamber. On the bed of state lies the king in the deep coma of approaching death. Beside him on a crimson pillow lies the crown of England. The young prince bends over his father. My gracious lord, my father, this sleep is sound indeed. This is a sleep that from this golden rigole hath divorced so many English kings. Thy due from me is tears and heavy sorrows of the blood. My due from thee is this imperial crown, which, as immediate from thy place and blood, derives itself to me. Lo, where it sits, which God shall guard and put the world's whole strength into one giant arm, it shall not force this lineal honor from me. This from thee will I to mine leave as tis left to me. The prince has gone with the crown. Now the king awakens from his coma, finds himself alone, cries out. Westmoreland! Clarence! Does the king call? What would your majesty? How fair so grace? Why... Why did you leave me here alone, my lords? Where is the crown? Who took it from my pillow? When we withdrew, my liege, we left it here. Prince hath taken it hence. Go seek him out. Is he so hasty that he does suppose my sleep, my death? Wherefore did he take away the crown? Lo, where he comes. Come hither to me, Harry. Depart the chamber. Leave us here alone. Oh, 
I never thought to hear you speak again. My wish was farther, Harry, to that thought. My life did manifest thou lovest me not. And thou wilt have me die assured of it. Then get thee gone and dig my grave thyself. And bid the merry bells ring to thine ear that thou art crowned. Not that I am dead. For now time is come to mock at form. Harry the fifth is crowned. Up vanity, down royal state. All you sage counselors hence to the English court assemble now from every region. Apes of idleness. Now neighbor confines purge you of your scum. Have you a ruffian that will swear, drink, dance, revel the night, rob, murder, commit the oldest sins, the newest kind of ways? Be happy. He will trouble you no more. England shall double gild his treble guilt. England shall give him office, honor, might, for the fifth Harry from curb license plucks the muzzle of restraint, and the wild dog shall flesh his tooth on every innocent. Oh, my poor kingdom, sick with civil blows. Oh, there will be a wilderness again, peopled with wolves, thy old inhabitants. Oh, pardon me, my liege, but for my tears, the moist impediments unto my speech, I had forestalled this dear and deep rebuke, ere you with grief had spoke, or I had heard the cause of it so far. There is your crown. And he that wears the crown immortally, long guarded yours. God witness with me when I here came in and found no cause of breath within your majesty. How oh, cold it struck my heart. If I do feign, oh, let me in my present wildest die and never live to show the incredulous world the noble change that I have purposed. Coming to look on you, thinking you dead... And dead almost, my liege, to think you were. I spake unto this crown as having sense. Accusing it, I put it on my head to try with it, as with an enemy that had before my face murdered my father, the quarrel of a true inheritor. But if it did infect my blood with joy or swell my thoughts to any strain of pride, if any rebel or vain spirit of mine did with the least affection of a welcome give entertainment to the might of it, let God forever keep it from my head and make me as the poorest vessel is that doth with awe and terror kneel to it. Oh, my son. Come hither, Harry, and sit thou by my bed. And here I think the very latest counsel that ever I shall breathe. God knows, my son, by what bypaths and indirect crook ways I met this crown. And I myself know well how troublesome it sat upon my head. To thee it shall descend with better quiet, better opinion, better confirmation. For all the soil of the achievement goes with me into the earth. Seemed in me but as an honor snatched with boisterous hand. And I had many living to upbraid my game of it by their assistances, which daily grew to quarrel and to bloodshed, wounding supposed peace. And now my death changes the mood. For what in me was purchased falls upon thee in a more fairer sort. How came I by the crown? Oh, God forgive. And grant it may with thee in true peace live. My gracious liege. <laughs> oh, oh. King is dead. Long live the king. Coronation Day. Cheering.
crowds line the streets of London to see young Hal, who has this day been crowned King Henry V of England. Now the procession is returning from Westminster Abbey. The cheers grow louder. In the front rank stands old Sir John Falstaff and his <laughs> disreputable companions. He is tipsy with wine and drunk with the prospects of his future fortunes as the king's crony. Stand here by me, Master Robert Shallow. Pistol, stand behind me. I will make the king do you grace. I will leer upon him as he comes by and do but mark the countenance that he will give me. God save thy grace, King Hal, my royal Hal, my royal Hal! The heavens thee guard and keep, most royal imp of fame. God save thee, my sweet boy. My Lord Chief Justice, speak to that vain man. Have you your wits? Oh, you what? Tis you speak? My king, my Joe, I speak to thee, my heart. I know thee not, old man. Fall to thy prayers. How ill the white hairs become a fool and jester. I have long dreamt of such a kind of man, so surfeit swelled, so old and so profane. But being awaked, I do despise my dream. For God doth know... So shall the world perceive that I have turned away my former self. So will I those that kept me company. When thou dost hear I am as I have been, approach me, and thou shalt be as thou wast, the tutor and the feeder of my riots. Till then I banish thee on pain of death, as I have done the rest of my misleaders, not to come near our person by ten miles. For competence of life, I will allow you that lack of means enforce you not to evil. And as we hear you do reform yourselves, we will, according to your strengths and qualities, give you advancement. Be it your charge, Lord Justice, to see performed the tenure of our word. Set on! <laughs> Falls at Columbia's Music Box Theater in Hollywood on the radio adaptation of Shakespeare's Henry IV. Downstage, acknowledging the enthusiastic applause, are Walter Houston, who played the king, Brian Ahern, who was Prince of Wales, Walter Connolly, who portrayed the rotund Sir John Falstaff, Humphrey Bogart, who was the turbulent Hotspur, and Dame May Whitty, who was Mrs. Quickly, the hostess. Ben Webster played Westmoreland, Ian McLaren was Worcester, Patrick J. Kelly was Sir Walter Blunt, Eric Snowden was Northumberland, and Jack Smart was Point. In tonight's performance, you heard Brian Ahern, who just completed the picture, A Great Garrick, for Mervyn Leroy. Walter Connolly, who appeared through the courtesy of Columbia Pictures, Humphrey Bogart, courtesy of Warner Brothers Pictures Incorporated, and Dame May Whitty, Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer. Conway Turrell was the narrator, and the musical score was arranged and conducted by Victor Bay. The play was adapted for radio and produced by Brewster Morgan. Next week, from our playhouse in New York City, Columbia will conclude its 1937 Shakespearean cycle with the delightful fantasy, Twelfth Night. Again, you will hear an all-star cast headed by Sir Cedric Hardwick, Helen Menken, Tallulah Bankhead, Orson Welles, and Estelle Winwood. Remember the date next Monday night, same time, same stations. Columbia's production of Twelfth Night. This has been a presentation of the Columbia Broadcasting System.